So good morning, good afternoon again. Uh, my name is Filip Leonarski. I work as a beamline data scientist at the Polscher Institute in Switzerland. And in this presentation today, I would like to show you an application of OpenCAPI for handling data from our new X-ray cameras at our synchrotron. So in this presentation, I would like to first give you a quick introduction into what we do at said synchrotron in terms of macromolecular crystallography. I would like to introduce you to the challenges that come with our new X-ray detectors. And I would like to show you how we solve these challenges with help of power architecture and OC Axel uh, software stack. So you probably know X-rays for the way they can penetrate matter and they can show what um, they can allow us to see inside matter. But it's not only as in imaging for on microscopic scale, but it's also on nanoscale. So X-rays allow us to know how atoms organize themselves into molecules and bigger structures. Now the photo 51 I'm showing here made by Gosling and Franklin allowed Watson and Crick to find how the double helix of DNA looks like. This was the photo was instrumental in finding the structure of DNA double helix. And this continues uh, till recently when um, researchers were able to find an atomic structure of a ribosome, which is a complex of more than um, 100,000 atoms. And with X-rays, they were able to find the positions of the atoms in this complex and to understand how ribosome is doing its functions. And we are proud that the PSI, as some of the structures that led to the Nobel Prize in 2009 were actually sought here in Vidigan. Now, to say about what X-ray crystallography is, it's an experimental science that allows to determine the atomic and molecular structure of a crystal through measuring how X-rays, X-ray beam is diffracted through the crystal. So we can see here an image that would be formed by X-rays passing through a crystal so the, the, the X-rays are diffracted in multiple directions. And by knowing intensities of the spots, we can build electron density of the structure and then the full atomic model. And actually up today, there are more than 150,000 of structures of molecules solved with X-ray crystallography. This is the, currently the most precise tool to find structure, atomic structure of bio, biological molecules. And there are more than 300 structures of COVID-related proteins that were deposited in the protein data bank and are available for researchers to design new drugs for COVID. So why actually is this happening at the synchrotron? Now, interestingly, for our high energy physics colleagues at CERN, there is an effect that is very undesirable. So when a particle, charged particle is bent on a magnet to make it go into round way, part of its energy is lost. Uh, so this requires more, um, more acceleration for high energy physics. It gets it more expensive, but it's actually not lost. It's radiated as, as a beam of very bright electromagnetic radiation, especially in the range of X-rays. And this is actually a blessing for the X-ray structural sciences, as this, the beam that comes from a, from a particle accelerator is many times higher than what you can get with conventional X-ray tubes that you see at the airports or at the hospital. So currently many accelerators are built to produce light, X-ray light, UV, uh, and not 
only as colliders like LHC and CERN. Now, in terms of light sources, there are two classes. There are synchrotrons, which you can see here. They are circular, so that the electrons, they fly on the circle, and there are magnets in many positions, and then they generate this beams of X-rays or other electromagnetic radiation. There are also long linear accelerators and can produce very short pulse. This is a new kit on the block. I will not talk about uh, free electron lasers. I can just say that we have one here um, in Switzerland on one side of the river. You can see a Swiss fell here, but I will focus today on the Swiss light source, the circular building here where I spend most of my time working on um, integrating X-ray detectors for crystallography beamlines. Now we have multiple techniques available at the Swiss light source. And one of them is biological crystallography. Now we have three experimental stations dedicated to this technique with users being from both industrial world. So pharmaceutical companies, which look for potential drug targets um, to bind proteins. But also we have academics from all over the world uh, that visit us. I mean, currently in COVID times, they only see us on the screen. They do their experiments remotely uh, and they do experiments to understand, to do basic research in structural biology. Now this year is special. We have a quite a lot of COVID research happening, solving structures of COVID proteins, but we also um, have other users doing remotely uh, measurements at our facility. They just send samples in liquid nitrogen and we mount them and they can measure. So how the end station looks like, it's a quite long X-ray optics, which is not shown on this image. And then there is a place to mount a crystal and this device in the back actually allows to rotate this crystal. Um, so the beam can hit different orientations of the crystal depending on how this device is rotating. Now the crystal can be mounted with a robot here and unmounted. So it all can be controlled remotely. And then the most important device from my side is this shiny surface here, which is an X-ray detector. Now the image that uh, we see on the detector from a crystal is a set of spots that look more or less like this one. And from intensity of the spots, we are actually able to tell 3D structure of protein of interest. Now PSI is also a major player in the um, hybrid pixel detectors. We were developing them for CERN and then we, researchers at PSI realized that the technology can be also used for X-ray cameras, which were Pilatus and Eiger, these are names of Swiss mountains. Now we have a PSI startup that actually commercialized the design and most synchrotrons are equipped with detectors. Now what is important about these detectors, there is a sensor that is a piece of silicon where X-rays are absorbed. And there is a readout chip which has dedicated electronics for each pixel. So a four megapixel detector, you can actually think as four million of detectors working in parallel. And currently we are rolling out a new design um, as while the all detectors Pilatus and Eiger were extremely good in looking on weak signal we could see a single photon, single X-ray photon on this detector very clearly, but they suffered from counter limitation, which limited the dynamic range of the detector, especially at very fast frame rates. Now we have a new design called Jungfrau, also from one of the highest Swiss mountains that addresses the limitations of the previous technology. Now, Jungfrau is a great detector to work at kilohertz frame rates. So one to 2000 images per second. And the way it achieves a very high dynamic range is 
through being able to dynamically work in three different modes. Now, when there is just a few photons coming, there is only a single capacitor operating, which allows to measure precisely with a low dynamic range. Now, when it, the pixel sees that the more photons are coming, it actually switches to a mode which is less precise, but has a very high dynamic range. So for example, in this uh, black spot, the middle one is measured with a mode that offers a high dynamic range, but maybe a bit less um, precision. And the outside is measured in the mode that is sensitive for low counts. Now this makes reading out data from this detector very complicated because we are actually not reading 17 here. We are reading that the mode which was used was G0, the blue one, and what was measured by the analog to digital converter. Now for this one, we know that it's G2, so it has to be converted differently. So conversion of the pixels is difficult. Now this is a modular detector. Uh, we have roughly 500,000 pixels per single module. Each module produces 20, up to 20 gigabits per second, which is just because we have two fiber links of 10 gigabit per second coming out. So a four megapixel detector can produce 160 gigabits per second. Now we are currently um, upgrading our light source to be able to have 10 times more photon flux. And this will allow us to do measurements 10 times faster. We could measure for our academic or industrial customers 10 times more samples per hour. But this enables us to do new techniques, like for example, screening thousand drug-like fragments, which is like molecular docking on a supercomputer, just with a fully experimental method. Uh, it also enables us a room temperature crystallography, but this increases, this pushes data throughput also by an order of magnitude. And looking historically from the day that the Pilatus detector was installed at the Swiss light source, we are doubling data rates of our detectors every two years. Uh, so we need to have sustainable computing solution to actually deal with this increasing of data. Now, what we need is a way to transfer the data from the detector, which is a simple device, uh, to a computer to be able to buffer. So detector has no buffering capability, it only streams UDP packets. So we need to be able to, to buffer everything and then either store it on the file system or do on the fly processing of this data. Now we tried two different solutions. We tried the conventional CPU centric first because that's easier. And then we tried the task specific architecture with Power9 and OC Axel. Now first approach, we bought just a very expensive four CPU socket server with quite a lot of memory. Uh, we wrote, we had already a receiver that is able to receive um, UDP packets just with a Linux system calls. We have wrote a, a highly optimized CPU code to do the conversion from this three different modes to linear scale and compression. We could reach roughly five gigabytes per second of the throughput from the detector to storage or to, to other um, streaming out. This, would this is the problem is in the interrupts handling in the way that the Linux uh, network stack is moving the data from, the, from and into the memory multiple times. But at the end, we could reach with quite a lot of effort, five gigabytes per second. And this would require to have four such expensive servers to handle the throughput. So we have started to look into a domain specific architecture because it's quite a trendy uh, subjects right now. And we looked into Power9 as this is a throughput optimized uh, architecture. It's known for having a high throughput. And we found there are actually two different options offered by Power9. We could either have a very high throughput with GPUs and NVLink, or a bit smaller throughput, but still high enough with OpenCAPI and FPGAs. Now, GPUs seem to be easier to program 
they do not offer real-time guarantee, while our application really requires um, that we are guaranteed that the, the things are handled in the real time. But on the other hand, FPGA is imperfect, but they are so, so complicated to program. And we thought that it's just impossible to implement our task in the FPGA without having an extreme effort and a lot of people and a lot of time. But then we talked with Snap developers in October 2019, and they told us, you don't need actually to do VHDL or Verilog. You just do high level synthesis um, with C or C++ um, and our tools will help you to do all the rest. So give it a try. We, we gave it a try and actually January 2020, we are able to collect data from a detector through SNAP and CAPI. Um, and it's only three months, we already have results. So we decided we want to really go for FPGAs. We want to invest time into, into this solution. Um, AC922 is amazing in terms of GPU throughput, but limited for FPGAs. And at this time, um, IC922 server was being introduced, uh, which has a significant open copy capability. And we decided to go for this one. In March 2020, we already have a pixel conversion. We have data acquisition and pixel conversion working with SNAP. Now later, quite quickly, we moved from SNAP to, to OC Axel and from CAPI to Open CAPI. And currently we have a system with two FPGAs being able to collect 18 gigabytes per second. So we have reached our objective in six months and we have good prospects that we actually can increase the throughput up to 50 gigabytes per second. Another thing, it's a very, energy efficient solution. Actually the FPGA takes probably 35 watts um, and it's probably um, five or 10 times less than the large server would actually take to do the same tasks the FPGA is doing. So the, the throughput, uh, the, the workflow we were able to do um, is FPGA actually receives the UDP packets does the conversion, does some filtering on the fly, and then saves uh, images into host memory. And after uh, compression, they can be sent via InfiniBand to online processing or storage. We're also experimenting currently with, with GPUs as well, which are available for IC922. Um, but the, the first benefit for us was that OpenCAPI has high, higher throughput than PCI Express. But then when I started to develop code for OC Axel, I found that the memory coherence and the ability for the process to see virtual, virtual memory space uh, so that the FPGA can see virtual memory space. This is just great because I can work with pointers on the FPGA. Um, I don't need to worry about trans translating physical and virtual memory or about the fact that um, something w is not cache coherent. Um, and then OC Axel abstracts the, how to use the open copy. I don't need to know how actually the transceivers in the open copy work. Um, I just tell the program to, to copy things from, from the host to FPGA and this, this happens. Uh, so I think from my side, OC Axel is really a tool to move um, FPGA develop development for software developers. Um, so as, as a software development project, um, I was able to also interface all of this with a continuous integration pipeline with GitLab, just I, as I would do with a, with a C code um, to use tools that provide unit tests because at the end of the day, my action code is a C code. So I can also compile this a CPU code, do all the testing, ensure that semantically everything is doing what it's supposed to do, but data structures 
are correct. And then I can start testing on the FPGA while I'm sure that at least the C code is correct. Um, and talking about the results, do we have any results? Yes, we have results. Um, we measured quite a few crystals already with the open copy readout. The most interesting one is one of our users provided us crystals of a nucleocapsid phosphoprotein. Uh, these were of course first measured with a conventional setup. We don't want to uh, waste uh, user samples for an experimental detector only. So we first tested with a conventional setup and the measurement took roughly one minute. It actually may, maybe even a bit more. And then we have tested the same crystal with a Jungfrau detector and open copy system. And we were able to collect 2000 images in a single second. And this allowed to solve the crystal uh, with a good enough quality. So it really shows that with the, with the open copy readout, uh, we can, for the new upgraded Swiss light source 2.0, we can actually reach the performance. So we have some challenges in front of us. We actually have this detector with tilted panels. You see it has 10 megapixels. So it will be 46 gigabytes per second that we need to deal with. We're already working with IBM copy team to extend design for higher throughput. Uh, we are also looking to do some feature extraction on the fly uh, to find the positions of the spots we are looking to use either GPUs or to use some free space in the FPGA um, to analyze this data. Um, and we are also looking for uh, machine learning and we especially high speed inference. And for this, we look forward for the, for the Power 10 um, um, online inference capabilities. Uh, and there are a lot of people involved. I would like to thank, first of all, my colleagues at the Paul Scherer Institute uh, from Crystallography Group, but also from Detector Group and Science IT, um, colleagues from Tectris, the company that commercialized the detectors, and from other light sources and particle accelerators. Uh, I would like to thank the Bruno and Alexandra and the whole CAPI team, because they help us really a lot. Uh, we also got a lot of support from Lionel uh, and his company Innobus uh, from uh, IBM Switzerland, um, as well as the IC922 early support program team. Um, and I look forward to see questions from you. Thank you. Um, so I have a question about how many T4 GPUs would do the job if um, GPUs are chosen to sort the images. Um, I 
currently just to do feature extraction, I use two GPUs at the moment and I'm not able to reach a two kilohertz uh, um, performance. Um, so I believe optimal would be to have four. Um, I believe that uh, the, the bottleneck is transfer between host memory and a GPU. Um, and ultimately, I think actually um, the, the algorithm could work with FPGAs as well. Um, so as soon as I have time to do with this, I probably would prefer to, to do it on FPGA. Um, so um, I also got a question, um, a very good question about the moving LZ4 compression onto the um, FPGA as well. Um, I had look into this because Xilinx is actually offering an um, um, code to do um, compression LZ4, but it actually requires quite, quite a lot of resources um, on the FPGA. Um, so it would not likely not fit for the bandwidth we need. Uh, so currently compression is, is the thing that we, we keep for, for CPU. So CPU can at least do something in this configuration. Um, so um, the next question is about um, how much performance, if any, is lost using OC Axel and HLS versus pure RTL. Uh, to be honest, I have no idea because I am a software developer. I would certainly not be able to uh, implement all of this in uh, RTL. Um, maybe Alexander or Bruno are able to answer this question, but um, I would like just to um, underline that, of course, with RTL, you could be better, uh, but the time to get to solution, uh, when we were talking with FPGA developers working at the PSI, um, it's just amazing uh, to be able to, in um, in few months to to get um, a working solution with a, with a single uh, developer. Um, uh, okay, so I also have a question with FPGA. Could you hope to do the exact the same job as GPU? Yes, I believe so. So the the algorithm. I have implemented on the GPU to do spot finding is actually uh, friendly to be uh, transferred to either CPU or um, FPGA because I'm not using any very specific uh, CUDA structures or CUDA calls that um, with regarding in communication between the threads. So I believe this code uh, uh, could um, um, could be done with FPGAs as well. Um, so I have a question: How many open cap FPGA cards have I evaluated? Uh, I evaluated one, which is nine H three. Uh, I'm very happy with the cards from Alpha Data. Um, it provides the the performance we need. It's also low power consumption. Um, so we were happy um, uh, with the card and we haven't looked into different ones. For us, the big requirement was HBM memory uh, because we need to load some conversion constants. Uh, and this is on the level of hundreds of gigabytes per second. Um, and this could be only achieved with, uh, with HBM and there's not a lot uh, cards that offer open copy and HPM memory at the same time. Um, OK. 
Okay, I think I am out of time for answering uh, the questions. Um, I have just, so what is the percentage of utilization for 9H3? Um, I don't remember exact number, but there is still space left for sure. And I have one last question about the cost of the solution. Um, for FPGA development, uh, a significant cost is uh, development time. Uh, and this uh, is actually much way cheaper with um, OC Axel and high level synthesis. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and I look forward for the discussions on Slack as well.